All right, we're going to be getting started in just a moment. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, I'm Gail. I'm going to be presenting uh, the Surf's Up Waves All Day unit um, today. Uh, Yadira and others might be joining us in the future, but I'm the one running the, running the show today. Um, we're going to be looking at lesson one, of, uh, lesson one of Surf's Up Waves All Day, um, which looks at video game history. We look at Jerry Lawson uh, and a few other game designers and talk about retro gaming and um and how that how how that's changed over the years um we also cover a different a few different aspects of game development uh in this unit or in this lesson um so that uh, that students get a good sense of like what game making is um so let's get started Um, I'm going to be walking through this as a, uh, as a, oh, hi Leslie, thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to be walking through this, um, sort of as I would present it to students, but also as I'm presenting it to teachers too. Um, but these are all come from slides that I use with students, give or take. Towards the end, I start to, um, focus more on, on other aspects of it, but I wanted to go through the lesson as it's written in the uh, in the unit lesson plan, um, so that teachers who are watching this now and in the future kind of get a sense of different ways they can take this. Because in the classroom, you don't really have the luxury of having a lot of time, and there's a lot of content in here, and not all of it is entirely necessary. The way I've written it um, is so that teachers can take what they what connects with them. Um, it's it's sort of overloaded with a lot of with a lot of ideas, so that teachers can pick and choose what they feel is important to their class. Sometimes throughout the unit, there are things that are thematically um, thematically working well uh, based on like what season it is. Other times, it might be something that's connecting with the scope and sequence. Maybe other times, it's just stuff that's interesting to your class. Um, teachers know their class best and what what might connect with them, or maybe it's just interesting to the teacher, and that's just as important. Um, because when teachers are interested in what they're teaching, the kids kind of pick up on that and, and start to get interested too. Um, but we're going to start with uh, the, the sort of warm-up question um, from the lesson, which is, uh, when do you think video games were invented? My son was supposed to be here today to answer this question, um, and he just said a very long time ago. Uh, he ran out of the room. He, he chickened out right before we started. Um, but uh, this is a good opening question um, to see what kids think. When you do this, you can, you can kind of give them more of a timeline, like do you think it was invented before or after computers, before or after television, before or after the radio, before or after, I don't know, electricity. Uh, and kids, will, kids can kind of put it in an, in an area of what they think. Um, but I don't know, most kids, when I ask this, uh, and I work mostly, when I've been doing this, mostly with young, younger kids, they are throwing out, they, they throw out years that are just ridiculous. Um, but it's, it's a warm-up question to get them to think about, about more of in the spectrum of, of different inventions where, it, where, it lay, where video games lie. Um, and so this is just a good, a good start question for them um, to get thinking about that. Um, And then after you ask this question, uh, as a warm up, you can ask them, do they know any, any old video games? That's an always fun one to ask kids to see what they consider an old video game. Um, sometimes they'll mention Pong or Pac-Man. Um, other times they'll mention games where like, I played those games in college and I'm like, that's not, that game's like 12 years old, which I guess is before you were born, but I don't know if that makes it exactly an old game. Um, but uh, it also gives you, it's also an opening question that gets you to understand what games the kids have played. Like they might bring up some Atari games. They often share, I, 
I've become good friends with a student and their family because I found out asking this uh, with a middle school student that her family is like big gamers. And uh, so now I'm friends with, friends with her and, and the family more because um, as a gamer, I, I, I recognize gamers and it's, it's fun to connect on that level. Um, but it lets you learn a bit more about what's going on with the kids based on what, kind, what they think about video games. Um, then we jump into where this lesson is supposed to talk about uh, game designers, the people who make the video games, because our students are going to be game designers in this, uh, in this unit, and so we want them to think about other game designers. Um, the most popular, one of the most popular video games of all time is Pac-Man, um, and so it would be important to, to talk about Pac-Man in this. Um, it was invented, it was designed by a guy, Toru uh, Iwatani, uh, and it was released in 1980. Um, we'll talk about genres more a little bit later, but it's a, a maze action genre. So it's an action game based around a maze. Um, so it's a bit of a sub-genre sub there. But, um, and I have some, should be able to hear this. <laughs> The, the sounds are instantly recognizable. When I, when I was doing this with my son, he wasn't looking at me, he just heard it. He was like, what game is that? Like, I've heard that before. It's not like he plays Pac-Man, but it's, a, it's a, an iconic sound. Um, an iconic soundtrack. Uh, it's just the, the limited sounds that are in the game. Um, and, uh, then, when I talk about game designers, I like to show who they are. Um, so kids can get a better image of who they are. And... In this lesson, I picked uh, a diverse group of game designers, um, representative of the diversity in New York City. So hopefully, many kids can see themselves as the game designers. Um, and so here's Toru Iwatani. He's also in the movie Pixels, which is kind of cool. The kids may have seen Pixels, and he, he is. He does make an important cameo in that where he gets eaten by a Pac-Man. Um, Pac-Man is also cool because you can look up videos and photos of it in New York. And so here's a picture of kids from in Times Square in 1982. Uh, I can only imagine um, playing Pac-Man and multiple cabinets set up there, you know, standing on a stool playing the game. Um, and it's kind of cool to give kids sort of that retro New York City history as well. Um, in, this in this lesson plan, uh, at the end I mentioned extensions where we mention uh, movement energizers. Um, and for uh, for the each game that you could talk about, and you don't have to talk about the games that I'm talking about, um, the designers are about, pick and choose what connects with you. But um, for each game, if you're especially if you're working with younger kids, um, it's nice to do a little energizer where they have to act out the game. Um, so after you show them, they you come up with an energizer where they kind of get up and move around. It's especially good for like younger grades, like kindergarten, first and second grade, where they're not you know, always willing to sit, sit and listen to presentations as much. Um, so for Pac-Man, uh, I wish my son was here for this, but we in the classroom, we have kids stand up and one of them is the go one of them is Pac-Man and the other ones are the ghost and they just walk around the table getting chomped and then we say, oh, you ate a power pellet and then they turn around and they have to run, not run, but like kind of like pretend like they're running um, and it's a fun energizer. I'll show you energizers or talk about the energizers for the other the other games as we go through this. Um, next up we have uh, Jerry Lawson, and this is where the title of the, part of the title of this unit comes into play, Surf's Up. Um, we talk about surfing for the first lesson, Surf's Up, um, and the rest of the unit is Waves All Day, where we talk about lessons two, three, four, and five, which are about electric waves, Sound waves, light waves, sound waves, light waves, and then uh, radio waves. Uh, I've considered doing an extension on brain waves, but I don't really know how that connects, and I'm already kind of behind on finishing everything. But there's more waves out there. Uh, and so Jerry Lawson, he is a um, New York, Brooklyn local um, who is a pioneer of, uh, of video games. He well, we'll talk about it more in a moment, but let's take a look at Surf's Up first. So Surf's Up is 
um, was released in 1983. Actually, it was never released. I say released, but it was created, and because of the game industry in the 80s, games were made and then not released because things were kind of falling up. The industry was falling apart. Um, and so it's a sports genre. And this is a game made for the Atari 2600. And I don't know if you've ever played an Atari 2600 game, but this is often how they how they look. Like, I don't know if that's I had an Atari as a kid, and I had a garage sale, and I've played a game that never... There are some games where you just like, don't know what's happening in this app. And, um, and surfs up. When I show it to kids, they kind of, they, they like to come up with different different ways about how it's working. Um, and when you talk about surfs up, uh, there's a few different things um, you can talk about. Uh, but one of the important things is because we're talking about games that are 40 years old, um, technology was much different back then. And it wasn't as power, CPUs weren't as powerful. Um, people didn't know how to make games as well yet. Um, there are people now who make and go back and make games for old systems, like the, the old Atari systems. And they are able to like make them look even better because they have modern, they have modern programming techniques using the same the same hardware, but modern programming understanding to to go back and like fine tune things to make the graphics better and the the way it works better. Um, but Surf Up's an interesting game because it used a special. Um, do I have the picture in here? So it used a special um, controller um, that used it used. I think it worked off of um, like a gyroscope. <laughs> type thing where it could measure your temp your your uh, weight so it knew how much you were tilting and so it had this thing called the joy board that you would stand on and you can control it by leaning left and right and forward and backwards um, and they created a bunch of interesting novel games for this and Jerry Lawson was tasked with building um, the surfing game for it uh, so it was a pretty cool idea that never really took off eventually the the Wii Fit board comes out in I think like 2006 where it, uh, it, it's similar and better technology and it's, it's used and it's pretty popular uh, for the Wii um, when it was out. Um, let's go back up to Mr. Lawson. Um, so we also want to focus on Jerry Lawson who created many games. Um, he started his own, his own game company, uh, Videosoft. Um, and he was, a, he was a true pioneer. He was a contemporary of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who founded Apple Computers. They were part of the, the uh, Homebrew Computer Club, um, where the first Apple computer was created. Um, and they all worked in the same sort of circles back then, um, around like Atari and other video game companies. And um, Jerry Lawson, he invented the first um, video game console uh, called the um, Channel F, the Fairchild Channel F. I don't know what the F stood for. I assume it was fun. I, I bet the fun, uh, even though it was also built by a company called Fair, which was like the Intel of their day. Um, a little computing history. The a bunch of high-level people leave Fairchild in, I think, the 60s and basically start Intel. Um, so that's why you don't really hear about Fairchild much anymore. But it was a very big company of the day, and it kind of um, launches the, the Silicon movement, really. Um, but they were getting into the video game market at the time. And so uh, Jerry Lawson, um, Fairchild created CPUs, microprocessors. And Jerry Lawson, to show how powerful they were when he was working at Fairchild, he created an arcade machine um, with a game and, uh, and, went to and showed them, like, look, we can make video games with our processors. And so then, um, I don't know, I can't recall the full story, but then they asked him to, uh, you know, since he made these, this arcade console with the Fairchild uh, CPUs, if he could make a console with it. And so he created this console with a team of people. Um, he was sort of the lead, um, the kind of like the, he, 
he was the engineer and the manager for it. Um, so he's kind of like leading the program. So other people participated in it, but he's definitely the significant figure um, that led all this um, development. And so he came up with this idea of swapping out cartridges. Up until that point, a game system just had like, one game on it, or you could cycle through a set of games that were already on embedded into the system, like they were baked into the baked into the memory, and you just like flip a switch to turn the game, but nothing that you could buy a cartridge and put a new cartridge in and get a new game that wasn't wasn't released with the console. So he made significant advancements in there, and in the grand scheme of of uh, of game history, we don't really hear about the Fairchild F that much, but they solved a bunch of problems that basically as Fairchild was coming undone, um, a lot of the people who worked there were um, hired by Atari, and so Atari basically took all the ideas that, that the Fairchild had figured out and applied it to their system. They even had to figure out um, legal mechanisms around like the the radio waves that the game system came out like you can see here in this picture that these wires are coiled on the controllers and that created an electrical signal that interfered with radio waves and so there was the FCC got involved with the release of the system and they had to do some extra engineering to figure out how how to release the system and basically once they did that the other game makers, the other hardware makers, were like, oh, this is how they did it. We can just follow their lead. So they figured out a lot of stuff um, about, about how to release a game system that wasn't previously known. Um, and they really paved the way, and, and Jerry Lawson paved that way for the companies of the time. Um, and it wasn't until recently that he gets a lot of credit for it. In the, um, in the resources for this, I have a few videos in a podcast that really explain the backstory. And they're not really great to show to kids, especially younger kids, just because they, uh, they're longer videos. None of them are really short. They're more like mini documentaries. But they really explain a lot of the history and a lot of what, what um, Mr. Lawson did around this and what the, fair, what the fair child really was and the advancements that it made and, what he w and how he was responsible for bringing this technology to the public and really making a big difference in the game industry. Um, he was a real um, experimenter, though. Uh, if I haven't made that clear yet. He was doing really interesting stuff. Um, here is a game that he made that was 3D. If you've got red and blue 3D glasses at home, now's your chance to put them on. Uh, and so this was another game for the Atari 2600 <laughs> called I think I talk about it in later on in the presentation. I think it's called Ghost Mansion or th Ghost Hunter 3D, maybe. Um, Ghost Attack. And so he made it so that it would cycle back and forth between the two colors so that it looks like the ghosts were popping out at you, making it 3D, which is a pretty cool effect, a pretty cool way to, to use the game. Um, sort of like the retro technology of. Uh, of 3D films as well, um, and you don't really see this kind of technique used in any video games back then. Um, and it's really, it's a really cool and interesting way to, to, um, to tackle video games. He he had some really cool experiments and cool ideas, um, and he goes on to to run a company, VideoSoft, where he makes a lot of other a lot of other games for other systems as well. Next up, we're going to talk about. Uh, Genova Chen and Kelly Santiago. Um, they created a game called Flower. Flower um, is a much more recent game. It came out in 2009. <laughs> it's, a, it's what they call uh, the art genre. Um, let's take a little look. This game, it uh, you can tell it's an art game because you don't really know what's going on, but it looks pretty. It's a good way to define art games. Um, and it came out for PlayStation 3, 
and uh, the designers for it were Genope and Kelly Santiago. And uh, it involves a flower. Um, so it involves petals flying around in the wind. And, and as you fly around, you release more petals as you hit the petals. Um, and uh, it was an interesting game. It was well received by critics at the time. Here's Genova Chen and Kelly Santiago. Uh, I believe I have an interview talking with them talking about so, the game. So, for instance, in Flower, we have a very minimalistic story um, to really invite the player to bring their own experience and therefore their own interpretation from the, from the game. You know, I grew up in, a, in Shanghai, which is a huge metropolitan city, but doesn't necessarily have that much green, you know. I've never seen a rolling grass hill. So when I come to California, I see these farms, endless green and windmills. It really gives me a, a sense of nature. I wanted to capture that because it's so overwhelming. It's like someone who never sees the ocean go to the beach for the first time. With a game, I can actually do that. I can let the player fly through the grass as if their face is next to it. They push away the grass, they can smell it by interacting with them at that close distance. But also they can fly up and oversee the entire the scale of the field. It makes you feel like you can go anywhere you want. So I thought that was an interesting interview because um, he kind of talks about the inspiration for the game. And as we're trying to raise game developers, we want them to understand what inspiration is and how it might strike. And so uh, that interview talks about how he's coming from Shanghai, um, where they don't have a lot of open space, and he's coming to California where he sees all these wide open fields, and he wants to, um, he wants to share that idea in a game. And so they created this game where you fly around in the fields and it's sort of like, surreal environment where you're just opening up the flowers and experiencing experiencing nature um, in a very artful way. Um, because we talk about so. uh, surfing, I thought we'd also do Subway Surfer. It's in a game I particularly enjoy. Um, I think it's, one, it's, it's the genre of the infinite runner. Um, you see people playing this on the subway usually. Um, oh, sorry, I'm getting over uh, an illness, and so my, my throat's a little scratchy, so I have to keep drinking water and juice to keep myself from having coughing fits. Uh, um, the game, ki kids probably know this game or know this genre of infinite runners. Um, the designers, Sylvester Richage and Bodhi Jan Mulliner, um, they, uh, I put this game in because we talk about surfing and there's another surfing game. Um, but in terms of looking at game designers, I try to feature game designers who had something interesting to say and, um, and made a real mark on society, like Toru Iwatani, Jerry Lawson, and um, Genova Chen and Kelly Santiago. Kelly Santiago goes on to work for Niantic, which makes like Pokemon Go and a few other geospatial games. And Genova Chen, I believe, works for Sony still doing um, game director work. Uh, but so. Sylvester, but the team behind Subway Surfer, it's, you know, it's like a micropayment like uh, game that really just wants you to, to pay money and take your attention. Um, I don't really know if it has a lot to say as a game. Um, there's other game designers to explore. Um, oh, I started to put in the games that they're known for, but uh, Kim Swift, who uh, s similar to Genova Chen and Kelly Santiago, she's kind of hired right out of college with a game that she creates um, that turns into Portal on the, uh, on the PC which is a very influential physics-based puzzle game. Um, Muriel Tramis is the first um, 
black female game developer who has a very interesting career. Um, and the resources, I think I have a podcast there, but I don't know if it's in the resources for this lesson or not, where it explains her history and her trajectory. And all of her, all of her early work is very interesting. And she was a game based out of France that made very interesting games about, uh, about her culture and her, and her ideas. Um, she came from uh, Montanique, um, and so her first game is sort of about the history of Montanique. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I listened to it on a podcast, and I didn't read it, and now I'm trying to. Sorry. <coughs> um, and I'm trying to recall what um, the, the, her th she has themes based around slavery um, in a very historical way, which is really interesting based on, on like Caribbean islands um, and the history there. Uh, and her games came out in the, I think the late 80s, early 90s, and they were, they're, they're all very interesting. Um, uh, we'll talk about her more in a, in a future lesson though, I believe. The rest of these, I have a smattering of, of people who I, I think are interesting and show the diversity of, of, uh, of game development. There's also a website, which isn't updated anymore, called We Are Game Devs, that has, um, um, it was created by a black developer who wanted to show showcase other people who work in the game industry. Um, and so it the last update, it, it was a website from 2016, and so it shows uh, a lot of different people um, who work in the game industry from that time period. So now we're in, when I do this in class, this is usually transitioning into another period, another lesson. Um, but, uh, so this is another kind of like warm up, but think about a game you like to play. What story did that game tell? Um, we want uh, kids to, to again think about inspiration and what, what the story of the games is. Um, especially as they're trying to design their own games and think about stories. Um, in this lesson, we talk more about the, uh, the different um, art around games. And so we look at here at Ghost Attack 3D, which was that Jerry Lawson game we were looking at earlier. And what I want kids to take away from this is that, is that the uh, developers didn't always have the graphics, the hardware, the hardware and the graphics to create what they envisioned. So here we have cartridge art, and the cartridge art looks kind of cool and cartoony, but then the game represents something that's very flat and pixelated, but that's because of the technology of the time. It wasn't because of the ingenuity of the designers or anything like that. They were just very limited, limited by hardware. And um, so we, so this, we're going to look at some different cartridge art and graphics. Um, oh, I should go to attack 3D again. We also look at the, the stories for the games. And this is a unique experience for some strange read-alouds in the classroom. So, if you look up game manuals, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, they show a lot of game manuals have stories in them that accompany the games to help kind of set the mood for the game. And so for Ghost Attack 3D, the story is they say the mansion is haunted, but nobody really knows for sure, and you've just got to find out. Armed with your photo beam, you begin your search. Suddenly there's a flash of light, then another, and another. They're all around you, coming from the walls, doors, windows, everywhere. You reach for your trusty photo beam. Now somebody knows for sure. Dot, dot, dot. 
Um, and so these are fun read-alouds for the kids. Uh, a lot of them are written sort of at a kid level, um, but the stories are like absolutely zany. I thought this was interesting because this, this story was written before Ghostbusters came out. Um, they talk about photo beams in this, and I wonder, I don't know a lot about ghost hunting history, but I imagine there must have been a lot of, a lot of science fiction about hunting ghosts in the, in the 70s where they talk about using photo beams and photon beams to catch ghosts because I've seen a few similarities in other, in other ghost things from that era, um, but I don't really know the history of it. Um, here we're going to look at Centipede. Um, Centipede was an arcade game first, and arcade games had a lot more power to them. Um, they were big systems that had a lot more CPU power than an arcade game, or sorry, than a console game. So the arcade graphics always looked better because they had more computing power than, than, than the consoles at the time. Um, that's not typically the case anymore. They're about on parity. But I just wanted to show the cool, um, the cool uh, cabinet art, and that's what they call these cabinets, um, of this cool centipede. And then the art on the cartridge, the cartridge art, which shows this wizard elf thing shooting a centipede, some kind of spider, a um, bunch of mushrooms in the background. And then the actual game where kids can see the mushrooms, the centipede, and the spider creature. And I guess that's the wizard with his wand. And then I have some gameplay of, of Centipede here for kids to see. And the read aloud. Which, when I read this, I was like, I had no, I played this game quite a bit. No idea there was a little bit. Once upon a time in a misty, enchanted forest, there lived a colony of good elves. These elves had a major problem, though. Their prized mushroom garden was infested with pests, a giant centipede, a poison, <laughs> a poison spreading scorpion, a mischief making spider, <laughs> and a pesky flea. The good elves tried everything they could to get rid of the garden, get rid of their garden of these bugs, <laughs> but nothing worked. One day, an elf named Oliver was hacking away. Hacking away the unusual stick looming in the dirt. Just as Oliver picked up the stick, a spider jumped out from behind. A mushroom rushed at him. But you can see the the, the level these are written is not. Um, it's, it's, it's a good kid level because um, they're made for kids. All the games at this time were, were thought of as kid stuff. Makes sense that game for kids. And this comes from the centipede instruction manual that I'll, I'll show you how to access later on, later on in this lesson. Um, this was an extremely popular. <laughs> sorry. This was an extremely popular game for the Atari called Adventure. I remember playing this as a kid and being like, I don't understand what's happening. But maybe when it actually came out, there's a lot of kids talking about it. And maybe everyone knew what was supposed to be happening, but I just remember getting this at a garage sale and being like, this game doesn't make sense. But it's, uh, it was very popular at the time. It's known as being the first game to, <coughs> to have an Easter egg in it. The, the, the developer of it an Easter egg where if you do the right things, it will show their name on the screen, which wasn't a thing at the time where they didn't really need the games. And so this developed the name into the game, which is a pretty, it's a, it's a big fact in video game history. We're in Robin. Okay. Oh, I forgot to talk about Centipede was made by 
Donna Bailey and Ed Log. And with Adventure, you can see, again, <laughs> you can see, again, really cool fantasy art for the game, the game cartridge, but then the actual game is pixelated. Um, and this is just because, again, at the time, the graphics were very limited. The CPU power was very limited. Um, they also didn't have a lot of time to make these games. They, the tooling was limited. Um, developers now, write, when they write code, they've got all sorts of tools to check their code, to verify their code, to make it easier to write. The languages are more advanced, um, so you're probably writing in, in C or C-based language, like C-sharp or, Mo or um, C++, or maybe maybe you're writing it in Swift um, for like a mobile device or, or Java. And these are like advanced tools that have lots of tools written around them to make it easier for developers. But back then, in the 70s and 80s, even the 90s, developers didn't have a lot of tools. And so they're writing an assembly, which is very like basic, um, you know, close, close to the metal languages, they would say. Like it's very, it's very close to like how computers really communicate. And so they're writing an assembly, um, and they don't have a lot of debugging tools. Uh, they don't they don't understand how the CPUs work in terms of like ways to optimize your code to um, to get certain techniques down. At the same time, they were brilliant developers who had to optimize their code all the time, but they didn't have like modern ideas like like ray tracing and and other like game engine ideas. Um, that came about decades later to, to make things run smoother. But m it was mostly limited by the CPU, um, by far. Uh, the CPUs were very slow, hundreds of times slower than what we're used to today. Um, and, and even the Nintendo um, had similar problems just being, being slow. If, you, if you're an older person who played NES games, Nintendo games, you probably remember like when a lot of things would happen on the screen, the games would slow down, and that's because the CPU was slowing things down um, because it couldn't keep up with all the artwork happening. Uh, and so they're dealing with very, very limited technology, very limited memory capacity on the cartridges. The cartridges, I think, were maybe only 4K, 4 kilobytes, which, which is like maybe a fraction of a second that's like a pa that's basically a packet of data you're you're in a in a streaming video like one one fraction one frame one picture um and they had to basically a fraction of what a cell phone camera takes the size of a cell phone camera picture <laughs> they had to make a game inside of there so they are very good at creating games and optimizing their code for data storage but they had to cut a lot of corners and didn't um have access to the tools that we have to today, not just the technology, but the software tools to make, to make video games. Um, Adventure had a story that <laughs> goes with it as well. Um, and so this is from the instruction, <laughs> the instruction manual. An evil magician has stolen the enchanted chalice and has hidden it somewhere in the kingdom. The object of the game is to rescue the enchanted chalice and place it inside the golden castle where it belongs. I really wish I would have seen this instruction manual when I was playing the game. I didn't know any of this and what the purpose of the game was. This is no easy task, as the evil magician has created three dragons to hinder you in your quest for the golden, <laughs> golden chalice. There's Yorgi, the yellow dragon, who's just plain mean. There's Grundle, the green dragon, who's mean and ferocious. And then there's Rindle, the red dragon, who's the most ferocious of all. Rindle is also the fastest dragon and the most difficult to outmaneuver. You can also see how in the instruction manuals, they're kind of giving you hints about how the game plays, that the red dragon is gonna move faster and it's gonna be harder to battle. Um, so these instructions are not just telling you a story, but also setting up sort of how the gameplay will, will go down as you progress, progress through the game. And then on the next page, they give you more details on the different castles in the game. Um, and so that, that wraps up the, the lesson. Let me just check my notes here and see if there's more to talk about. 
Um, so when you're going through this, uh, as we're talking about the story, <laughs> something to consider, the stories of games from these instruction manuals. You don't think about this when, um, when kids don't think about this when they're playing games, but modern games have thousands of lines of dialogue. Um, Pokemon has ten, the, the first Pokemon had like 10,000 lines of dialogue in it that people had to write. So there's lots of writers that get involved in video games and they have to write the dialogue. Um, every character, every what they call NPCs, non-playable characters, um, which is like the, the AI or the computers or the scripted part of the game, there's thousands and thousands of lines. There's some games that have over 100,000 lines of dialogue. And so game designers and writers are the ones who craft that dialogue and how it's going to work. Um, that dialogue also needs to be translated. So when you're creating a game like Pokemon, they're creating it in Japan, and then they have to um, local, they, what they call localizing it. They have to localize it to other regions, like America in English. Um, they have to put it into Spanish, German. And so these localizations have to go have to happen where you translate the code or translate the, all this stuff that's been written into other languages. Um, and that's a, <laughs> that's a demanding process. Um, I have some material that we'll, we'll discuss later in another lesson about, um, about that process, uh, especially if there's teachers who are interested in learning more about the localization techniques that game, develop, game makers have to use. Um, what else do we have here? I think that's I think that's it for what the, the the lesson's supposed to be. And then once you so the this unit is supposed to be a project based learning unit where the kids are working on a big project that goes together in the end. And so each lesson can have a different component of that project for for students to work on. Um, one of, the, one of the things, and you can take this however you want. Oh, I didn't put it in the lesson three there. Um, every lesson links to, so you can have different, different ways you want to take your project. And so I'm going to present three different pathways that, that we've done as we do this. And you can use these ideas, or as you're seeing these lessons, maybe come up with your own ideas on how you want the, the project component of this to work. But one aspect is a video game museum where every lesson links to a museum exhibit. As we're starting with video game history, um, it might be interesting for students to, to look at more about what a video game museum is. And we'll talk about this in, in lesson, in lesson two I talk more about conservation of video game history, which is a very difficult task because uh, the source code doesn't exist anymore for a lot of these games. Um, the, the systems don't always exist, uh, or sometimes the data is, you know, lives in the cloud for newer games, and how do you, how do you preserve stuff that's uh, online experience? How do you preserve that kind of game uh, for a museum? Um, but mostly we're talking about classic stuff. And so if you're going to make a video game museum, every lesson links to a museum exhibit. And so in lesson one, you could work on making your own cartridges out of cardboard and a cartridge art for them. You could profile some game creators um, using examples from that list that I gave you, or uh, we'll probably have more game creators uh, as this goes on. Um, or the students could write parts, write the creative parts of an instruction manual. So maybe they're making their own instruction manual pages and they're, they're writing a story for a game, but as though they're writing it in the instruction manual. Um, lesson two, uh, they could work on console designs like a blueprint um, or ads for consoles. Um, I showed you some ads earlier um, for the joy board so they can make some ads for consoles in uh, lesson two. Um, lesson three is sound, which is kind of hard to, <laughs> hard to, uh, hard to capture on paper. Um, so we'll, we'll get to some activities around sound when we get there. Um, <laughs> lesson four could be making um, retro pixel art for their games. Um, 
well, when we get to lesson four, I'll talk about different ways to make pixel art to make it work well for in the classroom. And then lesson five, which is radio waves, could be uh, creating unique controllers with blueprints or craft material uh, in the sense of like not a box. Um, because when we talk about radio waves, most controllers nowadays are wireless, and so they use radio signals to communicate. Um, here are some examples of the of the uh, video game museum that we had started setting up in one of the schools we work in, where they looked at game makers. Um, and let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. And these are their cartridges that they were making. Um, down here, they also have circuit boards, which I unfortunately didn't put a picture in for. Circuit boards for their consoles, but these are some of the cartridges they made out of cardboard. Um, we put other designs on them because just a picture on cardboard wasn't that exciting and we wanted to pizzazz it up a, bit, <laughs> a little bit. Um, so here are some, uh, some of their games, cartridges that they made. Um, and then, unfortunately, I don't have the pictures in here. Um, I copied the wrong one over, but it's got circuit boards in it um, that we'll talk about in lesson two where it's... Uh, it's kind of like shrinky thing circuit boards that we use shrink wrap to do, but you could also do it with paper. If you're familiar with the craft computing unit, you could do other craft material as well to make, to make these museum artifacts. Another idea that's probably more in line with what other people think about when they think about computer science is design and code a game. So you could use Scratch or Scratch Junior, and each lesson you focus on a different aspect of uh, game design based on the lesson. So lesson one would be getting the game idea. Lesson two would be continue coding because we're looking at the um, console side of things. So that's more of a coding activity. And then lesson three, you could start focusing on sounds. Lesson four would be sprites because lesson three is sound wave, so it makes sense to do sounds for lesson three. Lesson four would be focusing on, on sprites, on the graphics of it. Uh, and then lesson five would be finishing the game. Um, Unless you're using micro bits, it's hard to do radio-based stuff in the uh, in 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 Scratch and Scratch Junior. Like micro bit has radio signals, so you can focus. <laughs> you can integrate some radio wave stuff in there if you if you so choose. Um, another aspect of this could be craft a game, not design a game, but craft one using in the sense of like not a box. Uh, if you're familiar with the CS for All lesson. Um, <coughs> and the, the craft computing curriculum. Um, and each lesson you focus on a different aspect of it. Again, lesson one would be cartridges, making cartridges out of cardboard. Um, lesson two would be designing a console out of cardboard. Lesson three, um, they would work on an instruction booklet and in their story they would use onomatopoeias for sounds um, because you were making it out of craft material. It's hard to do sound effects with crafts, again, unless you're using some kind of electronic component. Um, but we present, when we get to lesson three, we do sound effects in a very interesting way that I think uh, everyone will, will see some great aspects there. But in terms of actually students, if you don't have the right technology in the classroom, it's probably best to try onomatopoeias with an instruction booklet. Um, four would be creating like a screenshot or like a TV screen for your console, but drawing the pixel art on there. Um, and you can print out your pixel art by making it on a computer or using a uh, graph paper, as we'll see um, when we get to lesson four. And then five would be making wireless controllers for your craft, not a box console. Um, I want to look at the extensions that we mentioned in the, the lesson as well. Um, so one of the activities we have is a timeline activity. Um, let me show you here. And so we have some examples here where students get, um, let me zoom out. Uh, oh, I need to thing. Um, students get uh, these paper, in this case, it's cartridge, it's games. So these are all storage mechanisms for games and they, we have two cartridges and a, a DVD, a mini DVD, and they have to figure out what, which one came first. 
Um, and this one's actually a trick one because the cartridge, Smash Brothers to Nintendo 64 cartridge came first, and then the GameCube CD, and then they go back to cartridges again for the Switch. So we have cartridge, DVD, cartridge. Um, and what's interesting is Nintendo used cartridges for a very long time um, because it was a good way to secure their, their data. Um, <coughs> but cartridges were more expensive and didn't ha have as much space back then. And so eventually they had to jump to discs, which were more fragile and easier to pirate, um, but they could hold more data. But eventually cartridges surpassed that again. Like we've, some of you probably have you know, flash drives that have 128 gigabytes on them, which is a lot. That's like 128 gigabytes is like multiple Blu-ray discs. Um, and you can get that in a cartridge now, uh, in a flash drive, a, th <laughs> a thumb drive, or a Nintendo Switch cartridge. So cartridges can actually hold a lot of data now. Um, here's a fun fact about uh, Switch cartridges. If you've got a Switch at home, try licking the cartridge. Um, Nintendo put a chemical on the cartridge to make them taste really bad. So when you lick it, it's really bitter. And they did that because they make these tiny cartridges um, that are you know, about the size of a quarter, and they didn't want little babies eating them. So they made them taste really gross so that if a kid sticks it in their mouth, they'll spit it out immediately, which is some interesting foresight and some interesting uh, um, user-focused design to uh, prevent kids from choking on Smash Brother cartridges. <laughs> I also have one for Frogger, and this is in the, the resource folder. <coughs> Frogger is a game that's got like multiple generations. There's like a new Frogger made like every five years. So this one is a little tri tricky. Uh, this, the answer is there in the resource folder for the unit. The, the arcade cabinet comes first, and then the 2600. You know, that, I think that's actually a 7800 Artari. And then Super Nintendo, and then, <laughs> and then this new one that you can see at like Chuck E. Cheese or Dave and Buster's now. Um, and so the kids look at these, and they have to think about which order to put them into. We also have one for Donkey Kong. <coughs> oh, there's some thunder out there. The weather report was right. Uh, Donkey Kong, cartridge, cartridge, arcade cabinet, and Kids also get to see the, the way that the, the art changes through the years. Um, Donkey Kong looked a lot different back then than it does now. And so the first one was the arcade cabinet, and then 2600, and then the NES. Um, and I think I have two more. I don't have printouts for it in front of me, but I have two more in the resource folder if you want to use it. Um, but it's a fun little timeline activity. Uh, for kids to put things in chronological order. Uh, we already talked about the, <laughs> the movement energizers. Um, as an example, for surfs up, they could pretend like they're surfing. Ooh, a big wave's coming. Ooh. Um, we have videos of it in class, but I don't want to put it on here because uh, it's pictures of kids. Um, another extension you could do, uh, we kind of touched on this, was game genres. Um, if you talk about, kids talk about genres in, uh, in the classroom a lot, but it, uh, for, for reading, but video games have genres too. And it has nothing to do with the story of the game. Like you can <laughs> have a game that's about like a horror story, but it might not be a horror genre game. This, the genres for video games are about the play mechanics of the game, not the story of the game. Um, so at the high level, there's action, adventure, puzzle, role-playing games, strategy games, simulation, and sports. Um, but then there's, there's many, many genres. Under action, there's like fighting games, there's um, shooter games, um, there's first-person shooter games, there's under simulation, there's lots of games too, like life simulators, kind of like Animal Crossing versus like um, vehicle simulators, like train conductor or Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, there's lots of different types of RPGs out there and puzzle games. So the genres are really interesting to talk about um, and get kids thinking creatively about what a game is 
what kind of genre a, ga a game is trying to be. And if you click on the, if you click on the Wikipedia link here, um, you'll see like a bajillion genres. Um, and they give good examples. In each category, they give some examples of the games. Um, it can be hard finding examples for kids because you don't want to pick like a mature game um, or like a, a teen game for elementary school kids, even though lots of kids play games they probably shouldn't be. Um, visual novels is a really interesting genre. Like some of these genres mostly exist in Japan. Like visual no novels were very popular in Japan. Uh, and only very recently did they start making it to, um, to the United States. Uh, and there's some like very artistic visual novels that, that have gotten awards in the US. Um, and you can see all the different types of puzzle games. Um, anyway, game genres is another extension. If, you're, if you have a more literature-based background, you want to talk more about genres in the classroom you could you could do a mini lesson or or focus a bit more on that in this lesson instead of game art you could focus more on the, <laughs> the genres of games and the earliest examples of genres for uh, for for different video games um, or you could look at it as genres that are popular in different cultures um, because there's lots of as I mentioned there's there's genres that really only get popular in, uh, in other countries. And, oh, I have more. Oh, let me go through the resources. So in the resources folder, uh, or in the resources um, section of the lesson plan, I have some different videos and other things. So here's a video, how Jerry Lawson changed video games forever. This is a pretty good video. You could show this video in a classroom. I think it's only five minutes long. And it's kind of a, uh, it's a quick video, relatively, it's a, it's a, it's written, it's made in the way that YouTube videos are made, where it's kind of like fast paced and, 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 and moves along quickly and um, is, is entertaining uh, for, for younger audiences. Um, I would recommend watching these videos, even if you don't show them in a classroom, because it really, it gives you a lot more than I can tell you in, in the minutes that I spent on it, talking about Jerry Lawson. There's a lot in here where it doesn't just tell you who he was, but it gives you a lot of what he did and, and the, the time period, the, the context for which he did these things in, which I think is really important for, for teaching about pioneers is, is knowing the context of what, what they were in and what they really did. And he, he's an extremely impressive person. And just saying he was the, was a, uh, the, the first black game designer doesn't really do him justice because he did a lot of, of interesting things um, and, um, and it was overlooked for a very long time. And getting the historical context for where he did those things and, and how that falls into the history of technology is I think really important um, to, to teaching kids about, about his story. I also have links for video game manuals. <laughs> um, I have links for, these are on archive.org. If you want to look for other systems, like a play, maybe, you're, maybe you're a slightly younger teacher than me and you grew up on PlayStation, um, you might want to look up PlayStation manuals, which also, that's really the, PlayStation 2 is probably the end of where they started making like weird stories in the manuals. But, but the Internet Archive, archive.org, has manuals for pretty much everything. Um, and so you can look up old Nintendo manuals. Um, They've got just, they've got pretty much every game. And so you just click on one and you click through until you see if there's a story in it. Not all of them have stories. Sometimes they just tell you how to play the game. Um, I don't know why I clicked on the Olympics one. That probably wouldn't have much going on in it. Ghoul School, I bet that has a story. Oh, it does have a story. Oh yeah, oh, it's got art with it too. Ghoul School, it looks like a good one. Um, anyway, so there's, there's free manuals you can download for pretty much every, every old game. A podcast I'd recommend listening to, um, Video Game History Hour, it's uh, episode 68, Fairchild, Channel F, where 
it's really about the Fairchild Channel F, but they talk a lot about uh, Mr. Lawson and this and, and all the work, the work that he, he had to do that we don't even think about. Like, like this is where I got my details about like having to figure out how to deal with radio interference so that the FCC would let them release the game system. Like all these little things, that in, and this is where I learned of how he uh, created an arcade machine uh, while working at Fairchild to show what their CPUs could do, what their processors could do, uh, which led him to creating the, the Fairchild F, um, Channel F. And then this is a longer um, YouTube documentary about the Fairchild Channel F that goes into a lot of details too. This also has interviews and video footage and, and, uh, of Jerry Lawson. So it's got, it's a, it's a long video that I think it's 30, 35 minutes. So it's not something you do in class, but you could show excerpts of it in class. But it's something that I think teachers, if you have the time to watch, please watch it. It gives a lot of backstory, a lot of, a lot of color to what you could be teaching the classroom about, about this period and how to bring and how to make this history come more alive um, by understanding more of the context and the stories behind it. Um, okay, that's that's all I have for uh, lesson lesson one. If you if you um if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me. Oh, hold on. Sorry, had to answer that. That's my babysitter trying to get in with my wild children. Um, the, uh, you can reach me at Galen, G-A-E-L-E-N, at sunsetspark.org. But if you're watching this, chances are you have access to the, the unit lesson plan, and, um, and you, can, uh, you can reach me through there as well. Anyway, bye. Thanks for watching.